Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to turn in my Bible too. (laughs) As we continue in this series called Rejoice, even though Paul is writing from a prison cell in Rome, he has a thankful heart. He has the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord was his strength. It's our strength as well. God wants us to live a life that rejoices. That's God's heart for us. He wants you to have joy, and he wants your life to shine for him. Well, in this series, today we're going to take a look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And I want to talk to you about why worry won't work. Why worry won't work. And let me just call you out from the get-go. How many worry wars do we have in here this morning? (laughs) Dang. All right. We're in the right place then. Worry. It's a serious subject. Frank was running down the corridor of the hospital. He was supposed to have surgery. He was bolting for the doors. The receptionist stopped him just before he left the hospital and said, Excuse me, sir, is there anything I can do for you? And he turned to the receptionist and said, Man, you know, I don't know that I can go through with this. Why, sir, what happened? Well, I heard the nurse say it's a very simple operation. Don't worry. I'm sure everything will be okay. And the receptionist said, Well, sir, I'm sure the nurse was just trying to comfort you. And Frank said, oh, the nurse wasn't talking to me. She was talking to the surgeon. (laughs) Worry. When we're stressed out and anxious, we're not at our best. It can be deadly. Did you know that anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States of America? plaguing 18% of our population, that's 40 million Americans struggle with this disorder. And the other 82% of us struggle with it on and off from time to time. We might not be medicated for it or seeing a psychologist or psychiatrist about it, but we all struggle with worry and stress and anxiety from time to time. Worry is a strong feeling of anxiety arising from negative self-talk. It's an inside job, this thief of worry that robs us of our joy that God wants us to walk in. So why then do so much of us worry? When we know it's not healthy, we know it's not productive. It's been said that worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't take you anyplace. So why do we worry? Well, at least for these reasons, we worry because we think about the worst case scenario of the situations that we're facing. We worry because we're walking by fear and not by faith. We worry because we have a tendency to be too controlling instead of just trusting and casting our cares upon God, knowing that He cares for us. And so Paul wants to talk to us about why worry won't work. He begins in verse 1, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown, So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. You know, you just sense Paul's pastoral heart here as he's writing to these brothers and sisters in Christ there at the church of Philippi. And he calls them his his beloved twice in this one verse because he has such a shepherd's heart. He's pouring out his affection to them in this thank you letter. He loved for them. He longed for them. And so it is that Paul had that shepherd's heart. He wasn't the pastor of this church, Epaphroditus was, but he ministered there and and helped grow the church as he went from place to place and had a love for the people. What a blessing that we have a pastor and a shepherd over us here at Venia in Tim Thompson 
who looks at us as his beloved, his joy and his crown. Pastor Tim loves each and every one of us. What a blessing. And so Paul says, stand fast. Now, we don't use that terminology very often in our English language. Stand up, sure, stand still, stand tall, stand proud, stand out, but what do you mean stand fast? It seems like an oxymoron. It's like, you know, you know I mean, what, what do you want me to do, Paul? Well, it could be understood this way. Stand firm or stand strong. Or as a New Living Translation puts it, stand sure. Because God has given us all the riches and blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. So don't let anything be taken from you. Stand for what's rightfully yours. Stand your ground. Don't let worry and anxiety and stress take from you what's rightfully yours, your joy and your peace. Stand your ground. Interesting, in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul's talking about spiritual warfare, he says, stand. He doesn't say advance, you've already gained everything in Christ. He certainly doesn't say go backwards. What do we need to do? Stand. Stand strong. Stand until the day that we are next to Christ, who was at the right hand of the Father. So, stand fast in the Lord my beloved, is Paul's plea to them and to us. Verse 2, And I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, Paul is appealing to the pastor of the church and to Clement to, to help these women out. Apparently there was some kind of a dispute or argument between these two ladies. We don't know what the subject matter was. The Bible doesn't say. We can, we can guess, but I think it's, it's good that God left it out because if it was some particular situation, we could say, oh, I, you know, I don't relate to that situation. I'm not dealing with that, so you know, I can't really get anything out of this. But God leaves it open-ended. They were just arguing. Listen, it's okay to disagree from time to time about issues as brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, God wants us to be peacemakers and, and have unity and work things out. But we're not always going to see eye to eye on everything. That's okay. See, I grew up with an older brother and sister there were times when, as family, my mom, my dad, you know, um, aunts, uncles, cousins, whatever, you fight. In fact, my brother and I would at times go, that's it, put on the boxing gloves, and we would, we would go at it, and we would get out our aggression, and he was six foot one and six years older than me, and so he'd beat the tar out of me every time, but it helped get the, you know, get it off your chest. Why is it okay amongst our biological family that we argue and disagree, but we're, we know we're still family and we still love each other, and yet in the body of Christ, somehow we act like, oh, if I have a disagreement, then I don't know which one of us is going to leave the church. Because I, you know, if I see them in the parking lot, I'm, I don't know what to do, you know. As if we're all supposed to get along perfectly all the time. Newsflash, we're not. We're going to disagree. We're going to get on each other's nerves from time to time. It, it may take time before you realize I'm right. So in the meantime, <laughs> let's still be family. I don't know what it is about our Christian culture. There's so many churches that you have options. So as soon as somebody rubs you the wrong way, I'm leaving and going to someplace else. When? Until somebody rubs you the wrong way again? You better hide out. You better hide in the back of the church. You better come late and leave early because it's only a matter of time if you hang out with people that there's going to be a rub. But the last time I checked, iron can sharpen iron. So let's fight it out. It's okay. Let's not be nasty about it. God doesn't want us to sow discord among the brethren. But you know what I'm saying? 
Man, it's okay. We're family. He goes on and he says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, because some people are a little slow, <laughs> rejoice. Now, Paul says this from a prison cell. And he doesn't say, hey, rejoice when everything's going just the way you want it to. Rejoice in the Lord always. We have a choice to rejoice. The joy of the Lord, the peace of God, is when we set our mind on the things of the Lord. And that's our choice. At any time, you can choose to have the joy of the Lord. It's a choice. You don't have to wait till everything lines up and everybody agrees with you and everything's wonderful. God wants us to rejoice all the time that there's a spirit. That doesn't mean that you're happy about everything that's going on. There's bad stuff, painful stuff that goes on, but you can still have the joy of the Lord in the midst of it. And so I want you to remember that. You have a choice to rejoice. And there are going to be times, I guarantee you, this week we're going to have to choose to rejoice because that might not be your first inclination. And, you know, one of the terrible, terrible things about being a preacher is that when you study and get ready to teach on a subject, God kind of tests you on that subject yourself. So stupid. I don't know why God does that. So this morning, um, I'm at the church office, and uh, we've got this weird door locking system in that complex where the doors are self-locking, and so... Um, Anyway, you got to grab the bathroom key to get in the bathroom, and you got it. So I go to the bathroom, and I come back, and I realize I didn't take my office key with me. So all I have is the bathroom key. I can't get back in the office. My keys are in the office. My cell phone's in the office. I have nothing but the bathroom key on my possession. So, yeah. So now I've got to go walk over to Lisa's house. To get Sydney to take to church with me, so I'm, I'm going to walk a half mile at 6.30 this morning, and as I'm walking, I'm like, oh my God, this is, <laughs> I mean, joy probably wasn't the best adjective to describe my frame of mind in that moment, because I'm the kind of person that the big things in life, you know, I'll, I'll face it, I'll handle it, it's the little stuff that gets on my nerves. Why? Because I'm too important to mess with this little stuff. <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said that, okay? Then I'm just like, really? And on my way to the bathroom, I'm like, man, this day is going great. Uh, you know, as soon as I, my message is almost completely done, as soon as it's done, it'll be time for me to get Sydney, get Sydney, get up my first cup of coffee, make it to the church, man, everything is just going great. And I'm like, so my reaction was, oh, man, I don't need to deal with this stupid door who created this system anyway, you know. And then the Holy Spirit's kind of like, rejoice always. <laughs> and don't worry, but pray. And so I'm like, whatever. No, I'm like, yeah, you're right, Lord. So I started praying. Lord, Help me not to be perturbed by this and just give me patience and help me to get to the house and, and get Sydney's cell phone and get a hold of somebody down at the high school and, and just, just work it all. And here's the amazing thing. As I began to just pray that through, I started laughing after I prayed. I'm like, oh, man, Lord, you're so funny. What a sin. And it's just like the joy of the Lord came back. Because I just gave it to God. God wants us to rejoice always. And that rejoicing is a choice. So he goes on to verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Some golden verses here in this section. Why gentleness? Of all the things Paul could touch on here, why does he say, I want your gentleness to be known to everyone? Because rejoicing has to do with what's happening inside of me and how it affects me. But gentleness has to do with how I am affecting you. 
And of all the things that Paul would ask for, he says, I want people to sense your gentleness. Because when you're being gentle towards people, it means you're in control. You're controlling your spirit. You're kind. You're loving. You're thoughtful. And this is a characteristic that Jesus was known for. He was gentle towards the children, gentle towards the lost, gentle towards the sick, gentle with his disciples. The only people Jesus wasn't gentle with was the religious leaders. And to them, he'd get out a whip and crack it and, and try and uh, get things straightened out. But he says, let your gentle be, gentleness be known to all men. Not just the people you like, but to everybody. Because the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. The time is now. Now is the time to walk in the Spirit. Now is the time for the Spirit of Christ to be reflected in your life. Because the opposite of that gentleness is, is being harsh and abrasive, rude and explosive. God wants us to be known for our gentleness. And then he says two of the most popular verses in all of the New Testament. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And everybody said, this is such powerful stuff. I cannot tell you how many times I've quoted this verse in counseling and, and just talking with people. Because it's a command with a promise. God begins by saying, I want you to be anxious for some of you that like to worry. I mean, you're a worry wart, you're good at it, you do it all the time, it's natural, it comes easy for you. Right now, you're like, oh, come on, God. Nothing, I don't get to worry about anything. Can I be anxious over some stuff? Certainly, there's got to be a few things I can be anxious about. God says, well, no. I want you to be anxious for Nothing. There's nothing you could ever bring to God's throne and say, surely, God, I, you, I have the right to be anxious over this. No. Nah. But my child's sick. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. There's never, ever a time you could go to God and say, God, do I have the right to be worried? Because it says that you don't trust God. Most of the time, our worry comes from us being more concerned about changing our situation than God changing us. He's on the throne. He's God. That's His job to be God. It's His job to be in control of everything, not ours. And so He commands us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything we're to pray and supplicate or cry out to God. And so here's a statement for us to take home today. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Prayer should not be our last resort. It should be our first response to take it to God. I was talking with Sidney. We were driving down to San Diego uh, just to go hang out. And she said, you know, Dad, I'm learning through everything that I've been going through just to go to God and, and to pray to Him and take things to Him first. I'm like, wow, Sid. As a 15-year-old, to learn that principle, that's powerful stuff. Most adults haven't learned to do that. Most adults said they won't go to God in prayer until they're completely exhausted, exasperated. They feel like they've got nowhere left to turn. Then they'll turn to God. And all along, all that worry and anxiety was for nothing. God gives us a promise here that when we go to the Lord in prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving that His peace will guard our hearts and our minds. Now, understand how key that is. When you go to God in prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving, thanking God for a lot of different things. 
Number one, you can thank God for all the other situations you've gone through in the past, and they work themselves out. So God, I thank you. I thank you for all the things you've already done. And I thank you that you're God. And I thank you that I can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find help in my time of need. And I thank you, God, that I can cast my cares upon you because you care for me. And I thank you, God, that you love me more than I love myself. And I thank you, God, that you're so gracious that I can trust in the outcome that you'll do what's best for me. And I have the faith to thank you in advance for whatever you want to do in me and in my situation. That's the right way to pray. That's powerful praying. And when you pray that way, something supernatural takes place. Something supernatural takes place. The peace of God begins to guard your heart and your mind. Something washes over you. Watch this. How many of you, by a show of hands, have prayed and felt your load lifted and God's peace come upon you? Let me see your hands. Ah. <laughs> These are all the same hands that were raised when I said, how many of you are worry warts? <laughs> we know both sides. We've experienced both sides. Let me ask you another question since you guys are so good at hand raising today. How many of you have gotten what you needed by worrying and worrying solved everything for you? <laughs> Funny how that works. Worry won't work. It never has. It never will. It's a complete lack of faith. But when you pray with thanksgiving and you go to God with your stuff, something supernatural happens. The peace of God just comes upon you. And notice, Paul says, it's peace that surpasses your understanding. Oh, I thank God for that. I thank God that I don't have to understand everything to enjoy his peace. That's some, some of you, that's what you're looking for. Well, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how, God, you've got three choices and one of them don't count. You've got you to gotta do this thing for me, God, right? And we don't, we don't know how it's going to work out. And, and sometimes we don't even see an answer. God says, how about if it's okay that you don't know yet? Is it okay if I go ahead and give you my peace even though you don't have it all worked out? That's what God can do. If God were small enough for your brain, he wouldn't be big enough for your problems. He's God. You don't have to know the answer. You don't know, have to know how it's all going to work out. Most of you don't know how your computer works and you still use it and enjoy it. You don't know how your car works and you still get in it and drive. So you don't know how prayer works. So you don't know how God's going to work out. So you don't know how wonderful he's going to be in your situation. But you know he is. I give it to you, God. Let him work it out. You don't have to know how it's going to be resolved. You can still enjoy his peace. And I love it when people come by. You know, how come you're not freaking out? Man, last week you were just so stressed out. You were such a stress case, you know. And now you just seem so relaxed. So, so what happened? Did you get that check in the mail? So what happened? Did the doctor's report come back, you know, negative? What's going on? No, I don't know yet. I still don't know what's going on. You don't know? Why are you so peaceful then? I prayed. I gave it to the Lord. I cast my cares upon him. I gave it over to him. You can do that. Here you go, God. And when you understand the grace of God, that he's good to you, he's a good God, it will become easier for you to say, here you go, God. This is precious to me. This is important to me. But I believe in your grace and goodness so much, I can give it to you. I've had a situation in my, my, my life recently where I'm like, Lord, I trust in your grace so much. Here, 
Whatever you want to do in this situation. You want to open the door, you want to close the door, whatever you want to do. And when you understand God's grace, it's easier to cast your cares and, and lay things at his feet and just say, Lord, I commend it to you. It's in your hands, God. One of the things that makes God wonderful is that God is a wonder. You're never going to figure God out. There's no laws and, and scientific method by which God has to operate all the time. That's why Jesus never healed the same person in the same way. It's like, do you spit on people? Do you tell them to go down and talk to the priest? Do you, I mean, what do you do? Jesus just healed people in a myriad of different ways. Why? Because it's not about the methods. God is outside the box. He transcends all that stuff. And he can give you peace even though you don't know how the situation is going to resolve itself. And ultimately, the most important thing of all isn't your circumstance. It's you. It's your spirit. And God wants joy and peace and love and strength and faith to be coming out of you. And when it comes out of you in the midst of your most difficult stuff, that's when it's the most powerful. So quit looking for God to fix everything. Let him fix you. Let him strengthen you. Let him do that work in you. And God's peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. To be anxious means to be pulled apart. God doesn't want you to be pulled apart. He wants you to be pulled closer to him. Now notice what it says in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. <sighs> well, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Why is it that Paul goes from prayer and, and not being anxious to write into, hey, Think on good stuff. Meditate on godly stuff. Why? Because it's our thoughts that produce the peace or the anxiety. Be careful what you think about. You dwell on the bad stuff. You dwell on the worst case scenario, all that. You're just going to breed that anxiety more and more. Meditate on the good stuff. Because... Worrying may, in some strange way, make you feel better. It may be your method to try and cope with things. It's not godly. It's a sin. It's a lack of faith. Not only that, can I tell you that it negatively affects the people around you? It's no fun to have to live with somebody who's stressed out and worried and anxious all the time, especially if you're a child. Your kids are looking up to you, mom and dad, and if dad is freaking out, they're like, man, if my dad can't handle it, is the whole world going to come caving in? If my mom can't handle it, man, what, what's going on? It breeds insecurity. They don't need it. One of the greatest things you could ever do with your entire life is to show the people around you, especially your children, when, that when life gets tough, the tough start believing. And that you can find joy and peace even in the midst of life's greatest difficulties. If your children can see that in you, your faith will make a mark upon their lives. But if they just see stress and worry and anxiety, they're wondering, man, what does my mom really believe? What is, what is my dad really into? How, is, is God not big enough to handle this situation? He's big enough. So meditate on the good stuff. Finally, verse 9, the, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Ted was starting up a brand new business and he thought what I'll do is hire somebody to take care of all my worries for me, especially as it relates to the money of the business. And so he began interviewing and there's this, this kid that just came out of business school, he interviewed for the position and Ted explained to him, I'm looking to hire somebody that will um, take care of uh, all my worries concerning money in this business. 
And this young guy says to Ted, well, how much does the position pay? And Ted says, $65,000 a year. And the young man says, well, with all due respect, sir, this is a brand new business. You're just starting out. How can you possibly afford to pay someone $65,000 a year? And Ted said, well, I guess that's the very first thing you got to worry about. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if you could hire somebody else to do all the worrying for you? You can. His name is Jesus Christ. He's your advocate at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you day and night. So relax. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Let's pray right now.